It's a pleasure to talk to you all today about addressing alcohol use in primary care. We're gonna be talking about what we can do and do do in primary care, screening, assessment, brief intervention for alcohol problems, non-pharmacologic treatment and pharmacologic treatment. I like showing this painting because it makes us recognize that problems with alcohol use are long standing. This is my perspective slide and we're gonna walk through it a bit because I find it very useful to understand alcohol use. And it's a pyramid and at the base of the pyramid, you can see it's abstinence. And that's to remind us that in our patients in primary care, a large minority, as it turns out in this country, US, don't drink. And so that can be normative behavior. You might wanna explore why that is, but we'll get to that in time. And then there's another sizable group that has low risk use of alcohol. That's good to know as well. And then we get towards the top of the pyramid and we see two groups, risky use, and alcohol use disorders. And risky use depends on the quantity and the frequency and alcohol use disorders depends on the severity. Both risky use and alcohol use disorders comprise unhealthy alcohol use, a term you'll hear me mention a few times during the talk today and one that was brought into the vernacular with the article referenced on this slide. We'll start with screening. And as we often do in medicine, we'll start with a case. So a 29 year old medical student enjoys two to three beers, two to three times a week after work. Is this person's alcohol use risky? Think about that one. And then consider this. This is our medical student and it depends. That's the correct answer to the question that I asked. One thing it depends about is what's a standard drink. Obviously what our 29 year old is drinking is not a standard drink, but be aware. And it's interesting sometimes patients don't realize that one beer, a 12 ounce beer is the same amount of alcohol content as one single jigger of brandy or spirits as is a glass of wine. So those are all standard drinks. And this is just a way of seeing a variety of them. One point about drinking from our patients is what are they actually drinking? Another one, as you can see here, because risky amounts depend not only on quantity, but on gender and age. Men equal and less to 65 years old, more than 14 drinks per week, or more than four drinks on an occasion is considered risky amounts. For women and men greater than 65 years old, it's more than seven drinks a week or more than three drinks per occasion. And why these levels? These are epidemiologic statements. When drinking gets to this level, quantity and frequency based on gender and age is when problems arise. And so, Risky amounts is a level of drinking where you may not have accrued enough problems to meet a disorder definition, but where problems might happen and recommendations to reduce consumption are wise. NIAAA, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, notes steps for screening and brief intervention. Step one, ask about alcohol use. Step two, assess if you find that there is alcohol use in risky levels, assess for alcohol use disorders, advise appropriate action in step three. And then remember, this is an ongoing issue, which is why primary care is so perfect a place to address alcohol problems, continue support at follow-up, wherever they are with regard to their alcohol use. There's more than one way that screening for alcohol problems can occur. I'll give you a couple that I like. 
One is the single item question. Now it's in quotes because the single item question are really kind of two questions. But the first one's simply, do you drink alcohol? Or more formally, do you sometimes drink beer, wine, or other alcoholic beverages? If you get a yes to that, you follow it up with how many times in the past year have you had five, or if it's a woman, four or more drinks in a day? This is actually a question I have in my head. It's like the only question I can keep in my head. If they ever drink, I then say, how many times? Not have you ever, but how many times? That's the question that was tested. And if they say anything other than never, it's a positive screen. And the screen has pretty good test characteristics, 82% sensitivity, 79% specificity for unhealthy alcohol use. Those top two segments of the pyramid we just looked at. There are other ways and probably the most, most well-known and best validated is the audit, the alcohol use disorder identification test. It's end questions and scored between zero and 40. Well, I can guarantee that I will not remember 10 questions, but it is the most widely validated instrument. So that's quite useful. If you get A plus score, it's unhealthy alcohol use with strong sensitivity specificity. 20 plus actually suggests alcohol use disorder. It doesn't make the diagnosis, but it suggests it. The problem is it's 10 questions and you have to score it. But that's not a problem. And in many primary care offices, you'll fill out some questions before you go into the clinic encounter with the provider. And this can be done, this can be scored and you can work with that score. So the audit's another way to go. Just to give you a sense of the full audit, I'm not gonna go through it all, but it assesses alcohol intake. How often do you have a drink containing alcohol, for example? Loss of control or physical dependence. Example there is how often during the last year have you found that you were not able to stop drinking once you had started? And related harms make up the last four questions. An example of that is how often during the last year have you had a feeling of guilt or remorse or drinking? So you get a sense it captures the past year. So that's the full audit. Now you have a sense of it and there's a scoring for it. And that would be something one could use as a practice. There's also an audit C, which is three consumption questions. Even though it's only three questions, there's a scoring with it. So even this is gonna be a pre-clinic assessment. If 10 questions is too much for your pre-clinic assessment because alcohol isn't the only issue you'll be dealing with in primary care, you might go with the three question. And that again has a scoring that goes with it. If you were to look at screening results in the US, 10 to 20% of people in primary care would meet our criteria for unhealthy alcohol use. That's data from a Kaiser Permanente large health system assessment of primary care alcohol consumption. And then if you look at from NIAAA, how common is alcohol use disorder they estimate 5.3% of people in the US have an alcohol use disorder. So quite a common diagnosis. Stepping back, the well-respected US Preventive Services Task Force made a recommendation as recent as 2018 about screening for unhealthy alcohol use and use of counseling interventions in primary care settings. And for adults, they recommend screening for unhealthy alcohol use. And in people who are engaged in risky drinking, proceed with a brief behavioral counseling intervention. That got a grade B recommendation, which at the bottom of the slide, you say that it's recommended it happen, and there's at least fair evidence that screening improves important health outcomes basically concludes that the benefits outweigh the harms. Adolescents, at this point in time, there just isn't sufficient evidence to make a recommendation. Okay, so it's recommended that 
screening brief intervention occur, it is useful to know, you might say it's sobering to know actually, what 50 years of alcohol brief intervention research teach us. And it's recommended because there is indeed modest efficacy for reducing self-reported consumption. In fact, about three to four drinks per week decrease when the brief intervention is done. And if you wanna look at unhealthy use, there's a 10 to 12% reduction in unhealthy use at one year. For example, some will decrease on their own, but 69% in this one case, but 57% in who got a brief intervention. So that's the reduction. But disappointing, and this is the sobering news, there's no evidence that it prevents alcohol use disorder. There's no effect on people with alcohol use disorder or very heavy alcohol use. There's no evidence of getting people identified by screening into treatment. That's disappointing, it means we need to do better and there's no effect on even referral to treatment. But not meant to be a complete downer on this, it is an approach when alcohol potentially adversely affects the clinical problem that one can use. And so it's very useful to have this tool in your toolkit in primary care. So let's take a look at the screening workflow. You screen and you screen negative for unhealthy alcohol use, as we just talked about, you're done. You really are, you've done what you need to do with alcohol. And now I'm gonna give you an off the record personal view that if you ask someone, do you ever drink alcohol? And they say, no, what I do, I'll just say, oh, why? Because I'm recognizing as we saw that although it's normative not to drink, some people will tell me, oh, because I'm in recovery doc. Oh, that's interesting. So you get an important piece of information. Or they might say, because my, my mother was an alcoholic, so I don't drink. That's useful information to have as well. So that's never been documented or proven, but that's my um, little clinical pearl. Okay, now we screen positive for unhealthy alcohol use. And where do we go from there? Well, at that point, we need to do an assessment. We need to assess for severity and readiness to change. And one can do that, one approach that I'll share with you is through a brief negotiated interview. Now, if alcohol use disorder is unlikely, we don't know that yet, but we'll determine that with our assessment, which we'll go through shortly, then you'll be recommending decreased use and monitoring. If alcohol use disorder, AUD is likely, then you want to move forward and treat or refer. Okay, so that's the big picture screening workflow. We're talking about for the 10 to 20% that screen positive in primary care. So we need to talk a bit about assessment. The DSM-5 alcohol use disorder criteria, knowing them is really the guide to your assessment. And we're gonna walk through the 11 criteria. The first two are tolerance and withdrawal. So tolerance. Tolerance is basically, we learn in medical school, using the substance the same amount over time and getting less in effect than I got originally, or needing to use increasing amount of the substance to get the same effect. That's tolerant. Your body's in a way growing used to it, so you need more of it. The other physiological criteria for AUD is withdrawal. I stop using the alcohol and I don't feel well. And we're not gonna go into withdrawal symptoms here. It's more of an inpatient issue, but you're likely aware because we all see plenty of it in our training, but that's another criteria for alcohol use disorder. The next bucket of criteria, I would say fall into a loss of control using larger amounts or using for longer periods than intended. An inability to cut down or to control one's use. Or an increased time spent obtaining or using or recovering from the use of alcohol. Okay, loss of control, three more criteria for alcohol use disorder. 
Then there's a new criteria that got added in DSM-5 that actually wasn't in the previous DSM-4, which is craving, I mean, a compulsion to use. You, you have to ask a patient to know, how are you feeling? Are you craving alcohol? And the last five criteria are fall under the category of continued use despite negative consequences. Have you not fulfilled your responsibilities at work? Are you having problems at school due to the alcohol? Are you having problems at home due to your alcohol? That's all role failure. Social interpersonal problems might be relationships. Reducing social work recreational activity. You don't do the things I used to do because I'm spending all my time drinking. Physical hazards. The classical physical hazard is driving while under the influence or physical and psychological harms, getting sick because of the alcohol use. We see a lot of that in the hospital. And then alcohol use disorder can be measured for severity based on the number of criteria that are positive. Okay, so we've screened, we've got a positive screen. We're doing an assessment of severity and whether it's risky drinking or moved into alcohol use disorder, I would argue that at that point, we need to determine the patient's perception of his or her use, both the need and perceived ability to change behavior. It starts with a simple question. Do you think your alcohol use is a problem? If they tell you like, what are you talking about doc? Well, that tells you something. And if they say, yeah, it's a problem, but I can't do anything about it, that tells you something different. So it's a simple question, but it's a rich question, gives you lots of information that are, is helpful. At that point, you wanna assess the patient's age of readiness to change behavior. And what do we mean by that? Well, the Prochatska and Di Clementi stages of change model really created for tobacco use can be applied quite well to alcohol use problems. And patients will be, with regard to their thinking about their behavior, in this case, their alcohol use, in one of these stages. Pre-contemplation is where they don't even realize it's a problem or they have no intention of changing behaviors. Contemplation is, they may be aware a problem exists, but there's no commitment to take action. And they're probably ambivalent. The hallmark of contemplation stage is ambivalent. They're ambivalent. Well, it's good. It's, I enjoy this, but this is a problem. But they're not taking action. Preparation stage is they've decided that it's something they need to take action about, but they haven't taken action yet. And then there's action, where they're actively modifying their behavior. Maintenance, they're continuing that modification of their behavior. Some new behavior has replaced the old. But with any behavior change, you're always at risk of falling back to the old patterns of behavior, that's relapse. So understanding where the individual is at with regard to their alcohol use, which stage of change they're in, really can help guide how you talk to the patient about what you will be recommending will be a reduction. And I'm gonna give just a couple of examples of the stages, the paper will, give examples for every stage, but pre-contemplation, we see this a lot in primary care. And it used to be when I trained that someone came in, had a big alcohol problem and had not a clue that it was an issue in their health. You had to like get them to stop drinking in that one appointment. And it was quite frustrating and not surprising why you just say, I can't do this. Taking a stages of change approach makes progress more achievable. So the goal of someone who comes in and you decide they're in pre-contemplation is to raise doubt, increase their perception, their consciousness that their alcohol use may in fact be a problem. How do you go about that? Well, you can express concern. I hear that you're drinking two six packs on Saturday night. That's quite a bit of alcohol intake that bothers me. You can state the problem non-judgmentally. 
that's obvious, but sometimes not always obviously done. So just be cognizant of what advice you give, you give in a non-judgmental way. They can say that this isn't a problem, Doc. I'm not sure what you're talking about. You can agree to disagree. You can say, I hear that you at this point don't think that your use of alcohol is a problem. But for the following reasons, X, Y, Z, I am concerned about you. I hear that you don't think it is an issue, but I wanna let you know from my doctor perspective, I disagree. I think it actually is a problem. So you can agree to disagree. In the pre-contemplation stage, you may say like, advise the trial of abstinence or cutting down. They're never gonna do that. And they may not. But if they really don't think it's a problem, they may say like, it's no problem, doc. I'll just stop using. So you can say, well, let's try that. We'll do a trial and I'll see you back in four weeks and we'll see where it's at. But it's important that you come back, even if you're still using, because this is a trial, we'll both learn from it. So those are some steps towards approaching a patient in your clinic. Maybe you're seeing for the first time, maybe you're just picking up the problem for the first time, who's in pre-contemplation. So now to the patient who's in contemplation. Remember, this is the one that's ambivalent. Maybe a problem, but not really a problem, but they're clearly not ready to change behavior or work on that. The goal here, as opposed to having them walk out and saying, I'm never gonna drink again. The goal here is to tip the balance. And this is actually quite fun, I would say, in primary care, question, answer, steps to go through, where you can ask, so tell me the things that you like about your drinking. Tell me the things you don't like about your drinking. No one ever asks them the things they like about their drinking, or not often. And so it begins to make them think. And then you wanna ask, because most of the time people will have periods of time when they didn't drink. And you can say, thinking back to that time that you didn't drink, tell me things that were positive about not drinking. And what were things that were negative, difficult about not drinking? They will put things on the table that you can then summarize. Sometimes patients will write them down. You can give it as homework and they'll come back and you can go over them. But it helps them think about the pros and the cons of their decision to continue to drink or to stop drinking. So it's, it's a way to approach the ambivalent patient in the contemplation stage. What it does sometimes, which is quite potent in terms of achieving behavior change, it can demonstrate discrepancies between their values and their actions. What do I mean? Well, they very much value their relationship with their kids and their family, and yet they've missed the Little League baseball game three times in the last six weeks because they were hanging out with friends drinking instead of showing up at the game. And that discrepancy between what they did and what they value can sometimes really motivate people to begin to think about and changing behavior. Again, with contemplation, it's actually a really good time for a trial of abstinence because they may not be sure. They may think they can cut it down, but they're not really sure if they can. So let's try it. You can, you, you can put it out there. Okay, there are other stages with other tips for those stages, but that you can find in the reference provided. But I want to give you some sense of where you can go with the brief intervention. More on brief intervention here. The brief negotiated interview, the BNI, is one approach. There's six steps after asking permission, and people feel like this allows people to feel more comfortable with talking about the alcohol issue, which generally they will feel comfortable about if there's not a negative dimension to your tone. Is it okay if we talk about your use of alcohol? Yeah, sure. Sometimes it's no, but then maybe we'll talk next time, you might say. Well, with this brief negotiated interview, I'm not going to go through the details, but you explore the pros and cons, just like we talked about previously with the patient who was ambivalent. You can review the health risk and you personalize this with the person's particular health risk in their situation. Maybe they have high blood pressure and they're drinking. Well, those are issues you can talk about. Summarize and ask key questions. So hear what they say and then personalize this interview with regard to their alcohol use. You can explore their readiness to change. On a scale of one to 10, 
10 being very ready, one being not ready at all. How ready are you to think about and stop your alcohol use or cut back on your alcohol use, depending on what the goal is? They say, about a four, Doc. You can say, oh, four. You can go above or below. They both have their own uh, interesting responses. Why didn't you say it too? And then it leads on to a discussion. You can negotiate the goals and we'll talk about what goals make sense to set depending on how severe their alcohol problem is. And you would explore the confidence. Maybe they say, I'm ready. I know it's a problem, but doc, I tried before, I can't do this. So you can explore confidence. On a scale of one to 10, how confident would you say you are that you'd be able to stop your alcohol use? And then you can follow that up just in the same way we talked about readiness. So these are interview techniques that help you do the brief intervention. A lot of fun, actually, very interesting, and takes a matter of minutes. As part of this process, as I mentioned briefly, you can provide personalized feedback and state your concern. You're just being honest. You're not telling them they're a bad person for doing this, but you're concerned about their health. You may be concerned because you have a liver function test result that came back that's abnormal that you think may be a consequence of their drinking. They may be drinking at levels that are in the top 2% of drinking in this country, and you can share that with them. People may think the amount they're drinking, oh, I'm only drinking this two, six packs a day, doc. Well, that's actually in the top 5% of drinking for people in this country. That's very high level. Or they may be doing the risky behaviors we talked about. Maybe it's boating and, and alcohol use at levels where they're not safely boating or driving or biking. Or maybe they've fallen. Consequences, the fall, the breaking of the bone, the fact that they have GI problems. Anyway, you can personalize, depending on what the situation is and related to their alcohol use, thought to be quite helpful. Explicit recommendations. This is good for you to understand that in some patients in this unhealthy alcohol use range, you don't need to tell them to stop. They're drinking at risky levels, but they've never had consequences. They don't meet criteria for alcohol use disorder or they certainly don't meet moderate severe criteria for alcohol use disorder, you can say, let's try cutting down. In fact, I saw a patient just earlier this week who he had this conversation uh, six, 12 months ago, some point before the pandemic actually, or early on. And they now come in and they had cut down from their heavy drinking. I said, what got you to stop drinking? And they're still drinking, but to non-risky levels. And they said, you told me to, Doc. I said, oh, that, that's good. Sometimes uh, people hear what you advise. So it's very useful to take advantage of that opportunity to have that conversation. So cutting down works for risky drinking, but abstinence is what you want to do when they've been unable to cut down after multiple attempts, or they have moderate severe alcohol use disorders. The recommendations are basically to stop drinking if you're into those severe, moderate, severe disorders. If you're pregnant or you're at the point where you're trying to get pregnant for women, the drinking should be stopped. Abstinence is recommended. And then if you have a medical condition, whatever that may be, alcoholic cardiomyopathy, basically abstinence is the recommendation, not decreased use. Motivational interviewing has become more popular the last three decades. It's a very handy communication approach, which can be used and was in fact developed in part to address people's alcohol use. And I'm not gonna go through all of it, but I'll take out some pearls that I find particularly useful that comes from that literature and a emphasis on personal responsibility for change. And I say this, I say, look, I can make these recommendations but I know it's up to you to decide what you're gonna do with your alcohol use. Only you can decide that. Giving a menu of options is thought to be helpful. So it isn't like just stop, go to AA meetings, but it's like counselor, 
AA meetings, medication. So there's different things that can be put on the table to help them with their alcohol problems. Using an empathic counseling style, and that can be done sometimes by reflecting back, by demonstrating that you understand how difficult this is for them. The, bot, the drinking seems to be really a good friend of yours, and I'm asking you to, to give it up because I think it's harming your health. That's not easy. That's an empathic comment. Giving clear advice to change though, just because you're empathic, just because you know it's their responsibility, it doesn't mean we don't give clear advice. You identify the problem and you advocate a specific change. I think your alcohol problems is really hurting you. Your liver looks sick by the measures that we got from the blood. It's time for you to stop all alcohol use and that's my recommendation to you. Being pretty clear. Doesn't mean you can't follow up with it. I know that might be challenging, but that's my medical opinion. Goal setting, we've talked about that some, but the point here is it's a discussion as well. You put it out there, but then it this supporting their self-efficacy is a motivational interviewing technique to say that they may not think they can do it, but you think maybe they can. And you can say, look, I remember when you wanted to lose weight and you took off, when you put your mind to it, you took off 15 pounds and you started to exercise. That is not easy. I think this is something that you can do. So that's supporting self-efficacy. That's just an example of way. Sometimes there's not much to say support self-efficacy. And you can say, look, you came to follow up at the appointment today. You can follow through on your goals that you set for yourself. Sometimes it can be as simple as that. All right, we'll move into some non-pharmacologic treatment. You've done all this talking and I'm gonna flip it around a little bit here. And we don't talk much about adults who are in recovery, relapse prevention in primary care. But there are some principles there. So in truth, probably more patients of yours in primary care are in recovery than people who are having unhealthy alcohol use. Remarkable, but actually been shown to be the case in some studies. So first you need to identify the patients in recovery. You may not know all your patients in recovery. Over time, you'll probably get to know. Establish a supportive patient-physician relationship, which is what we do anyway. But if you know they're in recovery as opposed to the year follow-up, you might make it a little more frequent than the year for a young, relatively healthy patient who is in recovery from their alcohol use. Early on, particularly mobilizing family support can be helpful. Facilitating involvement in 12-step recovery groups. It doesn't work for all patients, but it really, really helps a lot of patients. And that's something we'll talk about a little more. And it means more than showing up at one meeting and deciding if it's for you or not. Help recovering patients recognize and cope with relapse craving by developing a plan to manage early relapse. That's really what we call cognitive behavioral therapy. So you think about, I know it's gonna be a problem on that evening and how can I adjust what I do to deal with that problem when I'm gonna be around these people and I can't avoid it. Facilitate positive lifestyle changes. That can often be, I'm gonna get into an exercise program. I'm gonna start walking. I'm gonna start jogging. But these things can be helpful for one to stay in recovery. We're talking about staying in recovery now. Managing comorbidities. A threat to recovery can be a relapse of one's depression or anxiety. So staying on top of those comorbidities, which mental health comorbidities are quite common with alcohol use problems, and treating them when they come up is a path towards staying in recovery, relapse prevention. Sometimes pharmacotherapy can be helpful for relapse prevention. And when the time declares itself, getting further help with addiction specialty professionals is totally reasonable. 12 step programs. They're actually quite remarkable. They're very helpful for some patients. They're not for all patients.
be aware that with Alcoholics Anonymous, there's a focus on abstinence. They're not looking for cutting back, they're looking for cessation. And that'll be what the conversation is. If you yourself haven't been to an AA meeting, it's worth going to one. They welcome health professionals showing up at meetings and you can just explain you're a health professional and you wanna learn more about it, you will be welcome with open arms. They emphasize lifelong participation because recovery is a lifelong challenge. Use of a sponsor is encouraged. And that's a good question for someone who tells you they go to AA meetings. You can say, do you have a sponsor? Is the sponsor helpful to you? They're almost invariably helpful because if not, they change their sponsor. It is remarkable that the 12-step meetings are free. Not much in healthcare is. And there is research on the effectiveness of AA programs as noted below. They don't push research in their settings, but some research has been negotiated and carried out. So pharmacologic treatments. That's another armamentarium that we have in addressing our patients with alcohol use disorders in primary care. This review paper a few years back notes that pharmacotherapy is, quote, modestly effective, but greatly underused. There are three medications currently that are FDA approved in the US, disulfiram, acamprosate, and naltrexone. I'll speak a little bit about them for the big view here. Disulfiram, it works by inhibiting an intermediate metabolism of alcohol, causing flushing, sweating, nausea, and tachycardia if, if the patient drinks. I'll show you that mechanism on the next slide in a minute. Acamprosate. It's a medication that stabilizes the glutamate GABA systems and seems to cause a decrease in craving. The challenge with acamprosate is the medicine needs to be taken three times a day. Now, Trexone, it's a pill that's taken once a day. There's also an injectable formulation, which is given once a month. Now, Trexone, as you may know, is a mu opioid antagonist, mu receptor opioid antagonist. It blocks the opioid receptor. It reduces the reward in response to drinking. Okay, we'll drill down a little bit with this uh, treatment. But disulfiram is a classic pharmacologic clear mechanism where alcohol is metabolized to acetaldehyde in all of us and rapidly moves on to acetate. The reason why it rapidly moves on is because if it doesn't, the accumulation of acetaldehyde causes us problems, flushing, headache, palpitation, dizziness, nausea. Disulfiram blocks the conversion of acetaldehyde to acetate and all these symptoms result. Patients feel terrible and they do not like feeling like that. If they've ever had a reaction, they don't wanna have one again. And if they haven't had a reaction, they've heard from other people about the reaction. And that can be an adversive conditioning, which is really the way disulfiram works. The evidence is thin that it actually prevents people from ongoing use because if they don't take it, this won't happen to them. And when they decide they want to drink, they can stop taking it. I personally have found it useful when patients use it as part of their cognitive behavioral. They know they're going to be in a situation that's going to put them at risk. And if they take the disulfiram beforehand, they know it will be a message to them that they can't drink, even if they want to. Anyway, people use it different ways. It's probably the least used of the three medications, but it has its effectiveness. It can per se, as we talked about, in enhancing GABA reception and transmission, which is reduced by the chronic alcohol exposure. The usual dose is this two pills, this weird 666 milligrams. I've always thought it was a little strange, but three times a day. That one, I don't forget, that's gonna make it tricky. But some patients don't have a problem with three times a day medications, although I recognize many patients might. The thing to remember about a campersate is that dose reduction is required for renal impairment. So if normal renal function, fine. If not normal, then you might reduce the dose 
But if it's less than 30 milliliters per minute, then you can't use the camprosate. It modestly, I'm from the very beginning, I said these medications have modest benefit, but modest benefit is better than no benefit. The side effect to remember for a camprosate is for less than a fifth. The one side effect to think about is diarrhea, which occurs in a little bit less than one out of five individuals. Now, Trexone is the third medication FDA approved for alcohol use disorder. It's an opioid antagonist thought to reduce the reinforcing effects of alcohol. The usual dose is 50 to 100 milligrams a day. It's metabolized by the liver. But even if the liver is not 100%, you can give this medication. For end-stage liver disease, we don't use naltrexone. There is a long-acting injectable form. And there is modest reduction in return to heavy drinking. So these medications help. Not a panacea, but they help. They particularly help people who want help to decrease their alcohol use or stop their alcohol use. Their side effects with naltrexone, nausea, headache, dizziness, dysphoria. But once people get up and going, they often tolerate the medicine reasonably well. Additional pharmacologic take-homes. You may have thought, well, the now, trexone helps some, maybe I'll throw on a camprosate and then we'll have even better effect. But in truth, there's no additional benefit when the medications are combined. That's been looked at and was not found, unfortunately. One thing to remember, which is actually quite helpful, is that the use of antidepressants to address alcohol use has been looked at in the past and it doesn't address alcohol problems per se. But as we said, mental health comorbidities are common. If the individual is depressed, treating the depression with antidepressants will actually help their alcohol use problems. So important to treat depression with antidepressants and get benefit for alcohol problems. What we've covered in this talk is that screening, assessment, brief intervention, non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic treatment for alcohol problems are all doable and they're all possible in primary care. So your opportunity to address a problem that affects more than 5% of the people in the U.S. is pretty potent and pretty remarkable. I just want to acknowledge the slides were not my creation, maybe my amendments, they were taken from the Chief Residence Immersion Training Program, a NIDA, National Institute of Drug Abuse Supported Program, written initially by Rich Sates. And Lucero helps me put together this slide deck for our presentation today. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you about addressing alcohol use in primary care.